In this video, I'm going to start talking about uh, perturbation theory. And so this is one of the approximation methods used in quantum mechanics. And so the next several videos after this, probably quite a few actually, will be on different approximation methods. And so this one will start with perturbation theory, and in particular, non-degenerate perturbation theory. Uh, after this one, I'll talk about perturbation theory, and that will probably take several videos. And so we can talk about the first order perturbation theory. And so why might we need the perturbation theory? And the reason is not every atom is a hydrogen atom. And so quantum mechanics is really good at solving for a hydrogen atom which has a single proton and a single electron but what uh, what happens is you know when you add more protons when you start adding more electrons those things start interacting with each other and so they start disturbing the potential they start perturbing the potential I guess you could say and so we want to sort of take uh, the sort of ideal situation of a hydrogen atom that has a single proton and a single electron and then sort of perturb it by, say, you know, adding different uh, things to it by saying, okay, well, now we have a helium atom and so that gives us two protons and it gives us two electrons and how are those two electrons going to interact with each other that will make this different from the sort of ideal hydrogen atom. And so we'll start simple. So if we have an infinite square well, uh, then our time independent Schrodinger equation is just this, what I have here in purple. So it's just this eigenvalue equation here. And so with a complete set of n eigenfunctions, uh, they're orthonormal and where the superscript here, uh, so the numbers that'll be in the superscript in parentheses uh, are just sort of indicating that this is either the unperturbed potential or the perturbed potential and things like that. And so the perturbation, so I mean this probably isn't, you know, the kind of perturbation you would actually solve for, but this is just showing that we have this potential here where in our infinite square well we have infinite potential on on all sides here. So we have infinite here and then this would be zero potential here. But now we're saying that it's not zero everywhere. We have this little perturbation. And so uh, I'll give some examples here in a little bit about what these perturbations, what sort of realistic kind of perturbations might actually look like. But uh, we'll go through a little bit of the abstract stuff here first. And so we now need a solution for a real Hamiltonian. And so we're saying this is a real Hamiltonian and it's a sum of this sort of ideal Hamiltonian plus our perturbed Hamiltonian. So the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues will be a power series in this lambda here. And so, like I said, these ones with the zeros are, are ideal. So uh, the particle in an infinite square well, and then these ones with the ones are the first order corrections. Then we have the second order corrections and so on. And so we put these in our Schrodinger equation. And so we have our, our sort of ideal here plus this lambda perturbed. Then our ideal energy plus this lambda perturbed energy. Uh, and so we make a power series of this when we combine the like powers of lambda. So you can see I have the ones up here already sort of uh, put in this color, this sort of dark red color here, and then these ones in this dark blue. And so we see that, you know, when we take this uh, multiplied by this one here, or acting on that one there, that gives us a single power of lambda. And then we take this one that has no lambda and act on this one with a single lambda, that gives us a single power of lambda. And so that's what we end up with here in the first parenthesis with the single, the first order power of lambda. And then same with our energies here. Then we can have the second order and third and second order. We could go on to third order and fourth order and so on. And so our lowest order, which I have here in this sort of uh, bright magenta, uh, is just, like I said, the, the sort of ideal 
wave function equation here. And then the first order is the stuff in these first parentheses, so this uh, dark red and the dark blue here. And then the second order is the orange and then this sort of uh, olive green here and so forth. But uh, So we were using this lambda for bookkeeping, and so we can just set that equal to 1. We just wanted to collect the, the correct terms with each other. But now that we've done that, we can just set this equal to 1. And so we can do the inner product with this, what we have here in green. So this first order in green, which uh, when it's the complex conjugate is the bra vector here. And so we are taking what we have above right here and just sort of putting it into this Dirac notation up here with the inner product with what I have in green. Uh, and so yeah, by the way, I have all these things colored and, you know, I hope that the colors help you sort of keep track of where everything is uh, and stuff like that. I try to make it as intuitive as possible, but, and we'll see here in a little bit that, you know, I start kind of running out of colors at a certain point and have to just start using variations on the same colors. But uh, hopefully when watching this video and if you look at the lecture notes, which will be linked to in the description down below, that these different colors kind of help you follow along where things are and what's actually going on here. Because there's just a lot of, uh, there's it's, this whole thing with the perturbation theory is kind of a big wall of you know, mathematical text here. And so uh, I try to, you know, make the colors as intuitive as possible. But anyway, so because we have this being her mission, uh, we can move it. So we can sort of move it into there. And so now we're acting it on the bra vector rather than on the ket vector. And so then the, uh, the energy here, which is just going to be a scalar we can sort of move outside there and so we end up uh, when we are acting this on this green one here we just get our energy because uh, because you know the the Hamiltonian acting on a wave function is just the energy times that wave function and so we can move that out there and so then we should see here that what I've put in the square brackets uh, these uh, will cancel each other out because we have the same thing on both sides of the, the uh, equation here and so we end up with this uh, and so this here in the brackets is going to just be equal to one because we are uh, saying that these are sort of orthonormal. And so we end up with the energy being equal to this right here. And if we did it for the second order, we would end up with something that looked like this. And you could keep going for third order and fourth order and things like that. And uh, the, the higher orders you put on it, you're going to get more and more accurate with it. But uh, as we will see, the first order uh, is actually pretty decent. Uh, and so we can actually look at that here with an example. Let's, so let's consider a helium atom. And so we have our, our Hamiltonian here for the helium atom. And then we have the ideal plus our perturbed. And the ideal is, we're actually saying, because uh, because helium is two protons, we're saying that it's essentially the same Hamiltonian as we would have for two hydrogen atoms here. Then our perturbation here is going to be based on the electron-electron repulsion. And so we can just put the Coulomb potential in there, which I have there in red. And so we end up with this as our Hamiltonian here. And so we want to look at this perturbed part here. So uh, we have our perturbed part, and we're saying that's equal to this Coulomb potential. And so we want the expectation value for our energy. Uh, and so that will be the two wave functions here sort of sandwiching our, our Coulomb potential here. And if we evaluate this integral, we get this right here. And so then when we put in all these constants, so we have the Q is the electron charge, we have the permittivity of free space and the Bohr radius and, and pi and four and all that. And so it actually gives us this right here. So we add this to our ideal of two hydrogen electron uh, energy and get the total. And so this here was what we had for the two hydrogen 
uh, for the two protons, and then we add this here for our perturbation, and so we end up getting this energy right here. And the experimentally measured version is this, what I have in gold, and so we can see that's minus 1.265 times 10 to the negative 17, which is a little bit different than this negative 1.198 times 10 to the negative 17, and in fact we can calculate how different it is. And so it, it's a 5.3% difference. Uh, but if we did the non-perturbed energy, it's a minus 37.8% difference. And so we see that this gets us much closer. And we would keep getting even closer and closer if we did higher order perturbations. Uh, so the, re the negative result uh, makes sense uh, because the ideal gave a lower energy. And this makes sense because the electron-electron repulsion will increase the energy because we have this repulsive uh, force going on, which is sort of increasing the potential and sort of, you know, making it so that it's a higher energy than what we would have with the unperturbed system. So then we can think of the example too. And by the way, these examples, I actually didn't take from the Griffiths. I took these from my uh, physical chemistry textbook by David W. Ball. So that's just the second edition of physical chemistry. And I liked the examples in there better than the ones that were in uh, Griffiths. So these examples come from my physical chemistry textbook, but the uh, sort of abstract stuff is from the Griffiths textbook which uh, my physical chemistry textbook only does this non-degenerate perturbation theory. Uh, so I needed to use Griffiths if I even wanted to do the degenerate perturbation theory, which uh, I will talk about in future videos. And so for the example two, so let's look at the case of a particle in the box of length A, where the potential of the perturbed is this Kx. Uh, and so, you know, it's just a function of x which, you know, is is something that just kind of looks like that. And then the K is our slope. And so uh, this models something like this, which has a molecule that looks like that, which has uh, an electronegativity difference. And so there's going to be more of a potential uh, in one of them than in the other one. So that gives us uh, a potential that looks like this, where it has this slope to it. And so our energy will be our sort of ideal energy plus the perturbed energy. And so for a particle in a box, the ideal energy is this, and this is our wave function here. And so this gives us uh, this here as our, our real energy. So this energy right here plus our perturbed energy. And so we want to find out what our perturbed energy is. And so we use this, which is what we found in sort of the abstract stuff above. Then we plug in our wave functions here for the 1D particle in a box, which uh, are these uh, are these right here. Then we have our our uh, perturbed uh, Hamiltonians sort of sandwiched in between. Uh, we sort of combine these all together so we get this sine squared. Uh, we have our x here. We can move this 2k over a to the outside. We evaluate that integral and it gives us uh, this right here. And so this will be our, uh, this will be our perturbation energy. And so we have our ideal energy plus our perturbation energy right there. And so then we want, so we've been looking at the corrections to the energy. Now we want to look at the first order corrections to the wave function. So we have from above, this is our sort of first order perturbation right here. We can do a rearrangement. So we have, uh, so we've decided kind of subtracted this from both sides and this from both sides. And so we end up with this right here. We sort of factor out the the uh, wave functions here. So on the right side, this one here in brown is our ideal. And so it's a known function. And then it's a complete set of wave functions. And so we can put our purple one here uh, as a linear combination of these ones here in the brown. 
And so these right here are what are called the expansion coefficients. And so we can put these in the rearranged equation above. So now we have this summation here with our expansion coefficients. And since we have this right here, we can change out this Hamiltonian for this energy uh, right here. Uh, and so now we do the inner product again with this this green, uh, with this green, this unperturbed wave function here. And so now we have these inner products going on here. So we end up with uh, with just this right here. Uh, and so when we sort of rearrange this, so we, we want to solve for these uh, for these uh, coefficients right here. And so we just divide both sides by this right here. And so we end up with this in the end. And so this is the correction here for our wave function. And so we can take a look at that. Uh, so we can once again use our sort of slanted potential there. And so we have this as, uh, well, this is just carrying down from that. So we plug in our our uh, our potential right there, so our perturbed potential right there. And so we can say that this uh, in green and blue here are sort of the wave function for an excited state, where this in brown and this in black are for the ground state. And so once again, we have our, our energy and our wave function for the one-dimensional square well. And so we plug those into this equation up here, and we get this. Uh, so we are doing this subtraction here on the bottom. So when we do that subtraction, we end up with this. We're sort of factoring out these uh, these square roots of 2a, multiplying in by each other, and the x. So we get that right there. Uh, we do use this trig identity where we are taking these two sines and we uh, make it this one half cosine of a minus bx minus cosine of a plus bx. And so we can put those into the cosines right there. So the the sort of two pi over a and the pi over a acting as our a and b, which when evaluated, or we can just look it up in a table. So my uh, my physical chemistry textbook has tables for this in the appendix. And so we get this. Uh, when we put in all the constants, we get this. And so our wave function is uh, sort of the uh, the one here plus this, this coefficient times the psi two. And so we end up getting this as our correction on the wave function there. And so that is how we do the perturbation theory. So like I said at the beginning, this is the non-degenerate perturbation theory, which is sort of a, a special case of perturbation theory. In, in most cases, you know, like when we are talking about like a P orbital where we do have, uh, where we do have uh, degenerate states. So we have, you know, our, our P Z and our, our P, our P X and our, our P Y like that. These all have the same, the same energy, but they are different states. And so we have to do, uh, well, quite a bit more work actually to try and find these, uh, these different states or, you know, the corrections, the perturbations for these different states. But uh, I will start talking about that in the next video. Uh, so like I said, this is kind of a sort of special case here uh, with the non-degenerate perturbation theory. But we'll be using a lot of the same things that we used in this video in the uh, degenerate states. And so it's, you know, always kind of important to do the non-degenerate perturbation theory first. But anyway, I don't want to ramble on too long. I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.